Hi, Jason Sullivan here. I wanted to make a video on practice methodology for my students, for my colleagues, and for my friends. There's a lot of information that I've learned in other domains, such as embodied cognitive science, motor learning, motor control, kinematics, etc. And I've been applying that to how I practice and prepare for music. It's a little bit different than what some of my colleagues are doing, so I wanted to share and kind of explain it to you here. One of the most common ways that we practice pieces, I have a piece of music in front of me actually, I'll show you uh, for today's example. So lots of notes, but that lick in particular right there, kind of a, kind of a beastly lick for bass tremolo. So we're going to work on that lick for a little bit. Just the, uh, the 16th note runs right there. I'll give you a chance to kind of really see what's going on there. Okay, so that lick, I can't play it very well. And I want to play it well, so here we go. One of the more common ways to do that would be to slow the metronome down to a point where one can play it successfully, and then slowly kicking up the metronome and developing the ability to play it. And that would be a way to make sure that you're getting all of the articulations you want, uh, making sure that the pitch is where it needs to be, and that you have a consistent style of play. I disagree with this being a, a good methodology to use because I do think it has limitations and diminishing returns. I think there's a faster way to get the results. Based on uh, embodied cognitive science, I mean, one of the main pillars of that fundamental theory is environmental constraint. The environment constrains us, and through those constraints, mainly by affordances, we move about the environment. Embodiment also talks about, you know, the body that we're basically stuck with. You know, I guess we're, we're combining situated cognition as well as embodied, but I digress. In embodied cognitive science, or in basic motor learning, motor control, we have to coordinate motor patterns at a faster tempo. By slowing the metronome down, we might actually be changing the kinematics of what we're doing. We might actually be using different amounts of force production and ratios of muscular engagement in each individual movement of a key or a slide or a valve, whatever, what have you. And then when we speed up the tempos, we might find that what worked at those slower tempos is no longer going to be acceptable because we just can't get the job done quickly enough. From a neurological standpoint, same things happen. We have neurological pathways that are formed. Synaptic connections happen between neurons that travel through different regions of the brain. So if you're talking about information processing or cognitive neuroscience, we're talking about the way that the brain gets activated when we learn something. That includes motor learning, so doing things, moving our muscles. When we provide an environment where there's a lot of extra time, when you space things out, like when you slow down a metronome, there's all this extra neurological connection that can happen between events. It can actually go through different regions of the brain and access different modalities. And that's why we have time to consciously think about every single note we're playing. As we speed the metronome up, however, and as we get closer to goal tempo, there becomes a point, a ceiling effect, if you will, where that neurological pathway will not be able to physically, biologically, make it from point A to point B in the allotted time that we have. So then the brain figures out ways to streamline new neurological pathways, and it avoids a lot of the conscious processing centers of the brain. So we don't consciously think about every note we're playing. A lot of times what will happen is as you're preparing, a, let's say, a recital or an audition, You'll work up a difficult lick and you'll get to the point where you can play it really well and then someone says, well, what are the notes in there? And you say to yourself, I don't know. I, I have to go back and think about it. And then you go back and consciously think about it. It's because you're now having to go access different ways of thinking about it. The conscious parts of the brain were kind of removed because they took too long. So by slowing the metronome down, we open up all sorts of possibilities to kind of let these other ways creep in that we're eventually going to have to fix. Why don't we just cut out the middleman and start with a methodology that gets the goal tempo in mind right away? Um, as a brass player in particular, you also have to take in co into consideration uh, embouchure adjustments that are made all the time. We use multiple embouchures, whether we know it or not. Most of the time, we don't even know it. But we have to navigate range of the instrument. And when we slow things down, we allot for extra time to do so. So it might not create a method that works at the goal tempo. And so sometimes people can reach a, a ceiling where if you've got to play it at 100 beats a minute, and you practice it at 50 beats a minute, and you get really good at 50, and 60, and 70, and then all of a sudden you just can't get over 75 beats a minute because the way in which you learned, you know, from an embouchure or motor standpoint, it just can't get the job done any faster. So you essentially have to retrain yourself how to do it, and that can be a frustrating process. This has its own level of frustrations, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and demonstrate how I would practice this. So you can scroll through. I'll try to leave you little notes. You don't actually have to watch me go through a practice session. That would be a very lengthy video. But if you want to, it's here. So one more time. Here's the lick I'm going to practice.
Now, rather than slowing the tempo down, first thing I'm going to do is something called forwards chaining. And that's where I start at the front of the lick, and I'm just going to add one note at a time. So let's set our tempo here. Okay, so this is 125 beats a minute, and I am using my metronome program that has beats randomly removed. If you want to know more information about why I think that's important, you can check out my Innovative Practice Tools where I have metronome CDs available. Um, all sorts of information on why I think that's a great way to do it. But we've got 125 beats a minute going here, so I'm going to start at the beginning, one note, and just keep adding. So you can see that there are times where I add a new note and the previous notes kind of have a decrement in performance quality. That's because we're trying to chunk it together as one continuous idea. I don't want to consciously have to think about each note, so that means that the motor patterns are starting to get grouped together, the synaptic connections are starting to happen through regions of my brain that can handle this faster tempo. This also means that it's frustrating in that it doesn't sound good until it sounds good. You don't have that small steps of quasi-gratification by being able to nail it at 60, then nail it at 61, then nail it at 62. Here, it's just going to sound bad until you get it. That's one of the frustrations, but I still think it's a better way to do it. <laughs> Okay, so it's starting to come together now. Great. So that's the beginning of the lick. Another method that you can apply, and actually let's just take these nine notes and then that way we can keep it for brevity's sake. Another way is to do something called backwards chaining. And that's where I start with the final note and I chain all of the notes previous to it, like this. So it's starting to come together now, that's backwards chaining. 
A third way to go about is something called problem chaining. I've never actually seen it, but it makes sense to me. By taking a goal or a problem, let's say there's a certain connection. I'll show you here the lick. So this is the beginning measure of the lick, starting up on the D, you know, on the bass clef, going down all the way to the B natural. Let's just say that right here, uh, this, uh, let's say this A flat to F is the problem. All right, let's say that's just, it seems to be the spot where it's muddiest. I'm going to start with the A flat and the F, and I'm going to add one note before, and I'm going to add one note after, add one note before, add one note after. And so by starting right where that problem is, we can smooth out those, those motor patterns, those neurological connections, just our ability to play, however you want to think about it. And I'll add one note before. I'll add one note after. And add one note before. I'll add one note after now. And now I'll add one up before. So using these three methods, I work on it for a period of time until I feel like I have it reasonably under control. Okay, fine. Now, then let's say after a couple of weeks, I still don't have it perfect and there's some more nuance I want to get. Okay, fine. We've now established the pathways and we've established chunking the motor patterns in a manner where we're doing it at the gold tempo. We're providing the correct environmental constraint, the constraint being time. So we've got to practice it at this tempo. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the metronome on 125 and I'm going to slowly kick it down until I feel like it's perfect. Working from the top fast tempo down as opposed to a slower tempo working up makes a totally huge difference. Let's see what happens. Here's 125. <laughs> seemed rushed, seemed ragged. I'm going to slow it down a little bit. So let's go to 124. It's a little better, but I still think it can be cleaner. So here's 123. 117 beats a minute. I started at 125, that was the goal, and I got down to 117, and then I could play it perfectly. So then I write in my part, 117. The next time I go to practice this, I start at 125, and I kick the metronome down. And, and the way that I chart improvement is that, oh, this time I only had to go down to 119 to get it the way or where I want it. Oh, I only had to go down to 120 beats. Oh, I only had to go down to 122 beats. And eventually we get to the point to where we can play it at the goal tempo. I feel like this method is head and shoulders better than the old school mentality of slowing the metronome down and speeding it up slowly. Yes, 
you do get those little bits of gratification for playing it correctly at the slower tempi. But I do think you run the risk of painting yourself into a corner and having to reinvent the wheel when you get up to a tempo that's just a little bit beyond your ability to put the motor patterns together. To, together. Rather, uh, the neurological connections have to kind of reroute themselves through the brain. You know, they don't go through caudate. They got to go through putamen now, a whole other section. And so I do think in the long run, it takes you longer to get a consistent product at the tempo you need. I hope you find this information helpful or intriguing. Maybe you completely disagree with it. Feel free to leave me comments. I appreciate your support and happy practicing.